day before Christmas, and I got fired. I've been working as a CTO for the past six years, and I never experienced failure like this. Getting fired sucks. I felt ashamed, humiliated, and afraid. Actually, on Christmas Day, I, my girlfriend took me to the grocery store to pick out some last-minute gifts, and I remember she was just holding my hand, dragging me across the grocery store, picking out gift cards for me. And I questioned my own abilities. You know, I wondered, am I even cut out to be a CTO? And I had been a manager for a few years, so my programming skills had gotten rusty, so I worried about interviewing and finding a new job. It was the holidays, so hiring was kind of dead and slow, but I was desperate, so I just started shotgunning my resume, hitting up everyone I knew. And I had nothing to work on, it was Christmas break, and I wanted something to feel positive about, so I started working on a little side project. At the beginning of January, a couple weeks later, I flew home to Chicago, where I'm originally from, to be close to family and friends. I was in a pretty dark spot. It was a typical Midwest winter, freezing cold. And I was completely preoccupied with trying to figure out what to do with my life. I considered all options. I was kind of burnt out from management, so I thought about maybe getting a remote job kind of low stress and taking it easy for a while. I thought about maybe applying to a job in San Francisco, something lucrative, trying to cash in. And I even considered a complete career change and actually did quite a bit of research on different data science courses. Well, one night I met up with a close friend of mine to talk about my situation and get his advice. And after talking for a while, he asked me, he said, Avi, what would you do if you didn't need to worry about money? And the answer came to me instantly. I knew that if I didn't need to worry about money, if I could do anything, I would go off and build my own product, be a solopreneur, build my own business. And in fact, this had always been you know, my dream, kind of lurking in the back of my mind, behind fears of failure and concerns of not having money. But in this moment, in this moment, I felt I could do it. <laughs> that if I got started now and didn't quit, eventually, I could succeed. And so I did. Over the course of the next several months, I built and launched my own product and grew it to the point where it could pay my bills and I could work full time on it. Today, I'm going to tell you the story of how I did it. My name is Abi, and I built Pull Reminders. So I figured out my path, what I wanted to do next. But one problem was I didn't actually know what I was going to build, and I had no way to pay my bills. How many of you know someone who's maybe quit their job to go pursue a business idea, then you know, a few months later they're, they're drowning and you know, trying to recover and just find a job? Yeah. So I, I didn't want to end up in that situation. And I'm a pretty risk-adverse person, so I knew that to give myself the best chance to succeed, I needed a long runway. I figured that it would take me at least a few months just to test out different ideas and find something that could get traction, and then probably a year, maybe even two, before it could pay me a comfortable salary. And so my first instinct was actually, even though I had just gotten so pumped up about going and doing my own thing, my first instinct was to actually maybe just get a full-time job and work on my business on the side. And I decided this was a bad idea. And the thing was, I, I wanted to be able to pay my bills, you know, buy expensive avocados, whatnot, but I didn't want to be in a pressure cooker. I didn't, I didn't want to be you know, stressed out and, you know, again, end up burning out in a few months and giving up. And so instead of getting a full-time job, I looked into getting contract work. And you know, this, this turned out to, this worked out pretty well. I actually, instead of trying to get my own you know, freelance work, uh, book my own clients, I actually applied to a few different contracting firms, a 10X management, a company called Surge Forward, and a company in Atlanta called Promptworks. 
And the cool thing was, once I kind of interviewed and got accepted, they just sent projects my way. And so I was pretty easily able to find different contract projects to work on that were you know, full-time or part-time. And you know, this worked well for me. You know, in hindsight, I think, and when, when I talk to other entrepreneurs, I, I do see the advantage of burning your boats sometimes. It forces you to you know, succeed or die. But for me, you know, I'm, I know that that pressure is actually counterproductive to you know, me being successful. And so you know, my takeaway and my lesson is really that you, know, you shouldn't quit your job, and you should make sure that you have something stable, something you can rely on to provide, provide you a long runway. And that's how you'll actually maximize your chances of success. So remember that side project I started working on after I lost my job? That was actually pull reminders. And I'll tell you the little backstory of how I came up with the idea. So at my previous job, I was an engineering manager, and I, I managed the team, and we had a, how many of you guys are developers, actually? Okay, cool. So we had a code review process that's probably similar to, to the one you're used to. Basically, we would open pull requests, you know, code reviews on GitHub, and then share them with our team on Slack, and you know, ask people to review them. The problem was that these code reviews would take you know, hours, days, sometimes even over a week to actually get done. You know, I remember actually talking to someone on my team, asking them, hey, you know, why hasn't this code review gotten done yet? And, and he told me he had been nagging an, another person on our team for days and had basically given up. So this is bad. And as a manager, what I started doing was personally spending hours each day tracking the different code reviews that weren't done and personally nagging people on Slack to get them done. And, and this sucked. Uh, you know, I was supposed, I was the CTO, and I was supposed to be doing, you know, more important things, strategic things. But you know, I was just spending hours just just chasing after people on Slack. And so I looked for, you know, a way to potentially automate this. The really the only thing I found that seemed viable and that I tried was uh, setting up a custom integration with Zapier. So I'm guessing most of you are familiar with Zapier, but it lets you connect different apps and build custom workflows. So I spent a few hours one day setting up my own Zap. And by the end of it, I had a solution that actually cost $150 a month in terms of pricing. And all it did was post new pull request notifications into Slack. And it was around this time that I thought to myself that I could probably build something better. But again, I was still at my full-time job at this point and didn't start. In hindsight, I think you know, the fact that I pursued an idea that was a problem I had was, was really critical to my success. I you know, intimately knew the pain and the problem that I was trying to solve, as well as the people I was solving it for. And, and that's helped me you know, in all facets, facets of marketing and product development ever since. So it was, let's see where we're, so it was now about mid-January. I had some contract work, so I was stable. And I was working on pull reminders still as a side project, but I was also exploring a lot of different business ideas, uh, including crypto stuff. And uh, I'm embarrassed to say that. And um, you know, so I was working on pull reminders, but I, I didn't know if it was something anyone really wanted. And I certainly didn't know whether I could turn it into a business. And so raise your hand if you've ever built something that no one wanted and that you made zero dollars from. <laughs> so yeah, I've probably built over a dozen or so projects that have gone nowhere and are in the uh, startup graveyard, so to speak. And you know, at this point, I, I really didn't want pull reminders or whatever I was working on to suffer the same fate. So I, I did a couple of things to try to validate my idea. First thing I did was just actually Google pull request reminder. And a bunch of things popped up. And these are mostly just open source projects on GitHub that are free and you can set up yourself. And I remember I, was, I felt relieved when I saw this because I was like, OK, I, I'm not the only you know, crazy person with this idea. But I was also a little afraid because there were already these solutions that looked like people were kind of solving their own problem. And I didn't, you know, I didn't know whether anyone would actually want to use my tool or be willing to pay. So I did a little more research, and you know, they were kind of hard to set up and customize. And so I, I figured I had a shot at building something better. Really, the one other thing I did, I was part of the Chicago CTO Slack group. And so I just asked the group one day, hey, 
Does anyone else have this problem of pull requests, code reviews, uh, taking a long time? And I, I actually got a really strong response. Several people said yes, they did. It was kind of an interesting discussion. And actually, one person there said that at actually at Groupon at his last job, they had built their own bot to solve this exact problem. And so at this point, I was pretty confident that you know, it wasn't a crazy idea and that you know, it would have value for some people. But I still didn't know whether anyone would actually pay for it. And in hindsight, I think it's, it's really hard to know. To be honest, up until the, I actually made my first dollar with pull reminders, I had a lot of doubts about whether it could make any money. And actually, my last boss, he, he said something to me, the one who fired me, he <laughs> said something to me that's stuck with me. It's actually one of my favorite little mantras now. And he said, he said to me, when we were working on a new product idea there, he said, you know, if you're a pessimist, you'll be right. If you're an optimist, you'll be rich. And I think, especially as an engineer, it's, I'm, you know, I'm very skeptical, and it's really easy for me to pick, pick apart any idea and come up with reasons why it's going to fail. But in order to have a chance at success, you, you sort of have to have a little bit of blind optimism and faith in your idea in order to move forward. And so, so that's something I've adopted is just I, I try to force myself to have a little blind optimism. And even when I'm telling, giving myself reasons why something won't work, I tell myself, just got just to gotta stay positive. So I built the first version of my product in about three and a half weeks. And as probably a lot of people here relate, you know, when I started working on pull reminders, I was really excited to actually kill two birds with one stone and go build it using some new programming language and uh, Elixir, if anyone's heard of that. You know, I, <laughs> I was, uh, yeah, I'd been wanting to learn it, and I figured, you know, this, this, this will be really fun. I'll learn a new technology while I build this project. But, but I stopped myself, because this is a trap that I have fallen into many times, and I see a lot of other people making the same mistake, and that is to combine the idea of a passion project or a hobby with that of trying to start a profitable business in a you know, finite amount of time. And so for me, I realized that, look, you know, as, as much as I wanted to go learn these new tools and have a lot of fun with them, you know, I was trying to launch a business. And I knew that I had to deal with marketing and sales and customers and legal and design, et cetera. And so I knew that I couldn't be bogged down you know, learning new tools and figuring out how to configure uh, you know, Elixir framework or something like that. And so instead of picking a shiny new tool, I just went with Ruby on Rails, which cheer, <laughs> uh, which I was already proficient with and you know, was really productive with and didn't have to learn anything new. And so I guess my lesson here is that, well, first of all, I'm really glad I made that decision. Uh, I think otherwise I'd be in a world of pain. And you know, as, especially as software developers, I think it's, it's so tempting to go try that new shiny tool to build your business. And you know, my advice would be don't do that. Pick the most boring tool that you're already really proficient with. And you know, that, I think, has stuck with me. That's a problem I've actually run into multiple times, uh, even as my product has matured. I've, I've uh, been drawn to overcomplicate the tech side of the business. This is the first version of Pull Reminders. It's pretty simple. It just posts code reviews that haven't been done in Slack. This is basically still what the product looks like. I remember I you know, kind of go down rabbit holes sometimes. And I, I spent days, like hours and multiple days, actually iterating on picking the perfect emojis <laughs> for those links. Today, I, I don't have emojis at all. So. One of the interesting things, or one of the most challenging parts of actually building pull reminders has been uh, figuring out how to support all the different possible workflows, uh, code review workflows on GitHub. So you know, with any business, a B2B business, you know, different companies have different workflows, and you're trying to build a tool that can sort of you know, accommodate them all. And for me, especially early on, what I did is just focus on the most common use case. And you know, I think that was actually really critical to my success, because it allowed my product to be very turnkey. And today, I think especially in B2B, people are so inundated with tools and cold emails and whatnot. I think their patience level is very low in terms of trying a new product and seeing if it works for them. So for me, I you know, was able to make pull reminders very turnkey, something you could set up and get success out of within minutes. And you know, that's been really critical to, I think, my ability to you know, grow the business. 
So I launched at the end of January, and like a naive solopreneur, I really banked it on a tweet. <laughs> I had a handful of Twitter followers, and so I just envisioned I would tweet about my product, and we'd get tons of retweets, and I would get hundreds of customers. You know, that didn't happen. I got a few friends who you know, liked it, a few strangers who retweeted it, but really no one seemed that excited. I, certainly no one was offering me their credit card to purchase it. And you know, at this point, I still didn't know if pull reminders could be a business. And you know, in hindsight, I realized that you know, things like Twitter or like one blog post, those aren't really the things that result in success, uh, even though I think as creative people, we tend to really focus on them and get really excited about them. And you know, for me, the funny thing was you know, I got zero customers from Twitter, uh, but actually my very first customer uh, came in through SEO, and I, and, which was really weird. So you know, my advice would be you know, don't focus on things like tweets and you know, going viral. Instead, you know, think about what are the kind of slow, boring things that you can invest in that are going to actually lead to growth. So as I mentioned, so now it's, let's see, end of January, and I still haven't made a penny from pull reminders, and I'm getting a little anxious, maybe looking into some of my other ideas at this point. In any case, this, this changed when uh, one day I got an email from a guy named David. He is an engineering manager at a company called Monday.com in Israel. And when he emailed me, this was really the first time a legit human being, sorry, not a real human being from a real company reached out to me with interest in my product. And you know, I jumped out of my seat. I was like, oh, this could be my first customer. And so David emailed me, and he said he loved my Slack integration. I was flattered. And, but that he had just one feature request, and that was to disable notifications on weekends because it would disturb his team. So I was like, yeah, easy peasy. I'll just add a checkbox. This, you know, no notifications on weekend, and this will be done. So he emailed me back and said, actually, his weekends were Friday to Saturday, and not Saturday to Sunday, because this company's based in Israel. Of course, I had my you know, calm face, and I said, you know, no, no problem. I'll just you know, create. You can toggle notifications for every day. So you know, no matter what your weekends are, you can configure your notifications. And so again, this is my first chance at a customer Super excited, so I went off and you know, spent a day and a half building this and got right back to him. So about a week later, you know, he got back to me, he said, you know, it was working great, he had one more feature request. I, this is obviously truncated, he, he actually sent like six feature requests. And you know, while I was super excited to be able to work with a real human being at a legitimate company and get feedback, you know, I wasn't trying to run a charity, I, I started to get anxious because I hadn't gotten paid, and I wasn't trying to do this for free. So I decided to pop the question. I asked David, I said, hey, would you be willing to pay $15 a month to use pull reminders? And this $15 a month was completely arbitrary. To be honest, I, I just kind of picked a number that I felt like he, he wouldn't say no to, because being rejected at this point would have been pretty brutal for my confidence. And he got back to me and said, we are definitely willing to pay for something that gives us value. <laughs> so who thinks this means yes? <laughs> yeah, so I didn't know. This was, uh, you know, I stared at my, you know, scratching my head a little bit. And in any case, I decided to just let the matter be, and I went and built, you know, half of his six other feature requests. So a couple weeks later, I'm getting really anxious. I still haven't made a dollar. And so I emailed David again and said, would you be willing to pay $20 a month <laughs> to uh, use pull reminders? I, I have no idea, really, why I raised the price $5. This is in one email thread. I changed the pricing on him. <laughs> I think I was just resentful. You know, I was just going to, yeah, not, uh, anyways. And he emailed back and said that he was willing to pay but you know, he didn't know how. And in fact, at this point, I didn't even have a, I didn't have Stripe hooked in, or I didn't have a subscription for him. And so I built one right away and got my first customer. So overall, this process took over three weeks. This thread is just a monster, 45 emails, over 67 commits. And at the end of it, I made 20 bucks. And <laughs> thank you.
This was probably one of the hardest earned twenty dollars of my life. Yeah, maybe, yeah, pretty much. And but it was also one of the most rewarding. And I'm sure you guys know this, but the feeling of coming up with an idea and you know turning it into a real thing, and then having someone pay you for it and validate the value of what you created is one of the best feelings in the world. And it's really the, the best part about, still about running pull reminders today. And so in terms of lessons I took away from this is that you know, when, you, when you first launch your product and you start getting that initial interest, and by the way, I, my initial, these people who I became my initial customers actually did find me through Google, which is surprising. In any case, you know, when you start getting these people, I would, what worked for me was pretty much doing whatever they said even when that took my product in kind of weird directions that uh, you know, felt like you know, scope creep or you know, whatever. And, and that worked out for me. And you know, I think that's really important because whenever you launch a product, I think initially, it, it's usually not quite the right fit for what a customer actually needs. And so by iterating and just you know, going back and forth with this first user, I was able to build a product that you know, actually solved the need and could be commercialized. Okay, so I had my first customer, and for twenty dollars a month, and you know, I figured I would have some. Well, I did have some other leads I was kind of working with, and and at this point, I knew I, I needed to come up with some real pricing instead of just quoting people arbitrarily based on you know, my mood that day. And so, you know, pr pricing is hard. I looked at sort of other products out there, developer tools. You know, to try to price it based on my competition. I didn't, I didn't really have any. You know, this was the only commercial product that solved this problem. Uh, but one thing I did find is that you know, all the tools in this developer tool space really priced based on seat. So I knew that I was going to price based on the number of users, but I didn't know how much to charge. So I, thought, I asked myself, you know, what's something else that developers and development teams are willing to pay for that gives them productivity, uh, productivity value? And what came to mind was coffee. So I thought to myself, you know, developers, development teams, you know, one cup of coffee per month, which, you know, probably more than two bucks, depending on where you get your coffee. And so I actually decided, this really kind of stuck in my mind, and I decided to price my product uh, as $2 per user per month, essentially, so that it would be less than the price of coffee. And in my mind, this was, you know, a number that would be hard for someone to say no to, and I even thought about adding the copy on my website, productivity for, the, for less than the price of coffee. So this is actually, this is what my actual pricing looks, looks like, it looked like. And you'll see, it, instead of doing a per seat pricing, I actually went with plans. And this is really important. This allowed me, this still allows me to actually make a lot more money than if I simply charge per seat. Because for example, if a, company has you know, 14 developers, instead of paying me $28 a month, just a flat rate of $2 per user, they have to jump up to the $50 a month plan. Now, on the other hand, this also leads to some problems. So I, I've actually changed these thresholds a couple times, and I still get potential customers who email me and say, hey, like, you know, that, that jump from 14 to 50, uh, 50 or 50 to 100 is a little steep. And you know, I haven't found a great solution to this problem. I, uh, to be honest, what I do is I just offer people discounts, you know, 20%, 50%, kind of arbitrarily. Uh, but again, overall, this is, I'm probably making twice as much money as I would be had I just done per seat, because especially that jump between the seven developer and 25 developer plan, it's quite a big pricing jump and you know, has allowed me to grow my revenue a lot more quickly. So you'll see it kind of scales down my pricing as you go up. Uh, like the 75 developer a month plan is, is less than $2 per month per user. I don't have a brilliant reason for this. I, I think, again, I, I just wanted to give, make it hard for people to object to my pricing. So, you know, no magical reason for that. And I'm very embarrassed to say this, but I have an unlimited plan for $149 a month. Again, I, I know this is kind of a bad decision as far as maximizing my revenue, but the thing is, especially working alone, I, I really didn't want to deal with the sort of you know, high-touch sales process and you know, quoting people and dealing with that whole process. And so out of, I guess, laziness, I just you know, created an unlimited plan. So above 75 developers right now is $149 a month. It's unlimited. 
And again, I, I'm definitely leaving money on the table by doing this. And I've constantly kind of gone back to this. But as one person, I, I'm still not sure whether like, the money I'm leaving on the table outweighs the, the time I gained back and able to focus on you know, things like product and marketing. So you know, not sure, but probably not a good idea to have an unlimited plan. <laughs> So as the business started to grow, as I started to land customers, I ran into a problem I'm sure all of you are familiar with, which is I started to get all these feature requests. People would email me, chat me on intercom with ideas and requests, suggestions, and I didn't know what to do with them. In addition, you know, once I kind of wrote down their suggestions, I didn't know how to keep them in the loop or you know, tell other customers about the things I was working on. So what I did is create a public backlog. This is on GitHub, it's public. You know, design like a pretty typical Kanban board. And I used, I, first thing I did was just throw everything I was working, not everything, but the features, the shiny things I wanted to brag about to my customers, into this backlog and started logging it. I also started getting a lot of customer submitted issues here and you know, worked really well in terms of providing an easy outlet that my audience, developers, were, already knew how to use and submit uh, requests for. So just a quick example. So this is like an example of a feature that I created, sorry, issue I created. And what I've done here is just pasted the request from Intercom into the GitHub issue and tagged people so now they're able to follow it. And this is an example. You know, I also ran into this a lot where different users would email me with like a similar idea or a similar problem, similar feature requests, and they would have completely different ideas on how I should solve it. And you know, while I consider myself a decent product person, you know, sometimes I just not know what the best solution was and you know, whether it would work for everyone. So I have quite a, f quite a few issues like this where there's, there's someone submits an issue and then I actually tag a bunch of other customers to get their opinions you know, in real time about you know, what the best solution is. And so overall, having this public roadmap, it's, it's not only actually been a good way for me to just stay organized myself, but it's been a really easy outlet, a really easy solution for customers to submit requests to me and a way to keep them excited about the things that are you know, coming soon in my product. So it was now early March. I had a few customers, but I, was, I had reached the sort of dreaded stage of starting a business, I think, which is you have a product, you know it offers value, you have you know, pretty good messaging. You know, you can, if, you, if I get a coffee meeting with a CTO, I can probably sell him on pull reminders. But the problem was I just didn't have eyeballs right, on my product. I, I just wasn't, I didn't have a way to actually reach my target audience in order to make money. And this is, this is a step that I've always struggled with, even with my other projects. And it's something that in hindsight I think is really important to think about before you even start working on your product is assuming you are able to build something that solves a problem, and message it well, position it well, you, you're still going to really struggle to build, you know, build momentum if you don't have a way to, you know, with relative ease, reach your audience. Of course, things like content mar marketing are things you can invest in to do this longer term, but you know, I, I didn't have a long, that long of a runway for this. And so while I was working on pull reminders, I came across something called GitHub Marketplace. I'll go through this quickly. And basically, GitHub Marketplace, like a lot of third-party directories and marketplaces, you, know, you submit your app, they review it, and then if it gets accepted, people are able to purchase it through GitHub in exchange for a 25% cut. So when I saw this, I was like, perfect. This is, this is the answer to all my problems, and this will lead to success for pull reminders. And I applied, I submitted pull reminders to be reviewed, and I remember this, this is one of the most terrifying moments in starting the business was when someone from GitHub reached out to me to have this initial chat about my product. And I was so scared because I wondered if, you know, this is still kind of a side project at this point. And compared to the lot, a lot of the other mature tools on GitHub Marketplace, I, I felt a bit inadequate. Um, and so, but when we got on that call, I remember this guy from GitHub was super warm, super reassuring, told me he liked pull reminders and that I would be accepted. So this is what the listing looks like on GitHub Marketplace. People are able to pay. And April 1st is when I went live on the GitHub Marketplace. And naive once again, I decided to, again, try to launch a tweet that would propel me into you know, super duper profitability. This time, strategically, I even tagged people at GitHub. 
because I hoped they would re retweet it. Once again, that didn't happen. I think this actually got less retweets than my first tweet, which is sad. But the cool thing was that actually some people from GitHub congratulated me and supported me. And uh, this, this, was, this was a really encouraging moment for me because you know, especially working alone on this little bot called Pull Reminders, it, it often felt kind of small, you know, a little bit silly, and a little isolating. And so having these people from GitHub congratulate me really made me feel like I was actually part of something bigger. And this was a you know, big motivational moment for me. Funny enough, though, just like about a week and a half before this, I had woken up one morning, opened up Twitter or Hacker News or something like that, and heard that GitHub had just launched a brand new Slack integration of their own. I remember it was really hard to get out of bed that morning. Uh, <laughs> and you know, I figured that I was toast. I'd been working on pull reminders, and I, I just assumed GitHub had probably just built the exact same thing. So once I eventually did get out of bed, I immediately went and installed the app and luckily found that, at least for now, I was safe. They hadn't built reminders and, and other features, of course. <laughs> and while I was looking up information about this bot, I went on Product Hunt, and everyone, people were saying, the guy who created it at GitHub, his name was Brandon Keepers, and people were saying, you know, this Brandon guy, he's awesome, he's created all this thing. I realized half my open source libraries and my Rails app were made by him. I was like, shit. So, I actually looked him up, and he lived in Chicago. So, and I was in Chicago at the time. So I reached out to him. I emailed him and said, you know, hey, I'm about to go on the GitHub Marketplace. Would you be willing to meet me? Maybe give me some advice. And you know, I, was, I was really scared. I, I, I kind of saw Brandon as the guy who was going to maybe just crush my business and you know, make it irrelevant. So you know, I hope that you know, not only could he maybe provide advice, but maybe if he liked me, he would spare me. Right. <laughs> so we met up for drinks one night. I remember, you know, awesome guy. Uh, and he, uh, while we were having drinks, he he just he asked me straight up. He said, "So were you scared when you heard about the Slack integration?" And I said, "Yes, I, I was." And you know, he he laughed at me and said, "Look, you have nothing to worry about. You know, we have." no plans, no, nothing in the roadmap, anything like what you're building. And really, he was super supportive of what I was doing. And you know, this, this, was, this was a make or break moment for me. And you know, it worked out well. And you know, overall, GitHub Marketplace had, has worked out well for me. So again, sorry for scaring my MR, MRR. I wasn't sure it was something I wanted to share. But you know, today, I just, uh, this month, I just crossed 21K MRR. And really, the moment I got on GitHub Marketplace in April was when my momentum really started to take off. So by the end of the year, last year, I had over around, I think, 350 paid accounts. And then I have actually uh, about double that in terms of total accounts, because I give my product away for free to open source projects and nonprofits and pretty much anyone who asks for a free account. So. You know, I talked earlier about kind of runways and you know, figuring out how you pay your bills. And you know, one of the problems for me, and not just for pull reminders, but actually on other projects I've worked on, especially with co-founders, has been deciding when to go full time. I think as you know, bootstrappers, this this moment when you're able to quit your job and go full time is like you know a huge milestone for everyone. And especially when I've worked with co-founders. This has sometimes been like a point of tension. You know, one person is go, 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 ready to, ready to burn their boats and go. And you know, like I said earlier, I'm, I'm a pretty risk adverse person. And so I am not willing to make this leap just based on my emotion. I've always needed you know, a, a really calculated, methodical way to go about this. So I think I've come up with, I'll share the way I did it. And you know, maybe this can be helpful to you if you're thinking about this for yourself or with your co-founders. So in hindsight, I hate that I came up with coined this term for it. But so it kind of starts with this idea, sorry for the name, minimum viable monthly income. And really, for me, this, this wasn't like the minimum I needed to make ends meet. And in fact, you know, when I've had conversations with co-founders, we've had conversations where we're literally looking at our monthly expenses and trying to find you know, what's the, the minimum you need to go full time. But for me, as a risk adverse person, this doesn't work for me. Because if I'm just making the minimum, you know, while I'll be able to pay my bills, psychologically, it's just too stressful and makes me too anxious. And 
will result in me basically imploding. And so for me, my minimum viable monthly income was actually around $6,000 a month. And so you know, I'm, I'm a single guy you know, living alone. This, this is far more than what I needed to survive. But this was the number where psychologically, I felt like, OK, if I'm making this, I can keep going. I, I, you know, I won't get negative. I won't get FOMO about you know, maybe just going and getting a job. And so first, I came up with this number, $6,000 a month. So then in terms of trying to figure out, OK, so when should I actually quit uh, or quit, quit my contract or can focus full time, I, one option was to wait until my MRR actually reached $6,000 a month. But I, but I knew that this was probably you know, not taking advantage of the opportunity I had because I had gained some momentum. And I knew that even with the momentum I had, it was going to take a few months to actually hit that $6,000 a month MRR. So instead, I kind of came up with this idea to comfort myself and you know, rationalize when I should quit. And basically, I came up with the idea of like the total amount of wealth I was generating in a month, which was my MRR plus the increase in the hypothetical growth in the valuation of my business. So I did 3x monthly recurring revenue. And so this, this formula you know, made me comfortable because I felt like, OK, if the total amount of like wealth I'm generating for myself exceeds my you know that minimum sort of comfort level, then then I'm okay. And this formula allowed me to actually you know quit sooner because it factored in the momentum and the growth I had. So I think I was actually able to quit uh, you know while I was still around like 3,500 MRR or around 4,000 MRR when I factored in the growth and momentum I had. So again, I you know as a risk adverse person and someone who believes that being risk adverse is you know actually beneficial to my ultimate success. You know, this is the formula I came up with and you know, hope that it might help some of you in your conversations and thought process about setting when to go all in. So another thing that I've worked on that has been really tricky is building a referral program. And you know, I think B2B is really tricky because you know, how do you incentivize a person to share your product, even though it's actually the company that is a customer. And so I've tried many things, and they've all failed. So I'll just share them with you quickly. First thing I tried was to offer gourmet coffee and tea. I spent a whole day actually researching the different roasters you know, across the country and cropping their logos into here. And the reason I thought of coffee and tea was because I figured like developers, you know, I didn't want to end up on Hacker News as the guy who was trying to bribe developers into uh, sharing my product. So I figured offering coffee was sort of like a low risk, a very non-aggressive way to ask for referrals. Didn't work at all. Uh, the next thing I tried was Amazon gift cards, so just offering cash. This was something, you know, I, I asked some of my friends, hey, like, you know, what would you do to make you actually want to share this? They said Amazon gift cards. Didn't work. And so I, I jumped. But I added this call to action after that to try to just offer cash. So every user, even today, gets this prompt at some point inviting them to share my product and earn cash. And this is what my referral program looks like today. I just actually use PayPal, so it's all digital. In total, I think I've generated about five referral customers, so pretty disappointing. And the thing is that I know word of mouth is, is happening because my business has grown faster each month without me doing any additional marketing. So it, at least you know, in my mind, that has to be word of mouth that's growing it. And you know, it's been kind of frustrating to not figure out a way to amplify that. So I guess the lesson is like B2B referral programs is a, is a tricky thing. And uh, so, so beware. Uh, really quick, I get asked a lot about onboarding and sales. And uh, for the most part, my product is self-service. But I, I still do manually, well, now more in an automated fashion, onboard and sell to users. And so I, a lot of products I've seen out there, they, you, know, you sign up for them, and then uh, uh, you get a drip email campaign. <laughs> and uh, personally, I've always found them uh, you know, a little bit annoying and not super helpful. And especially with a developer audience, I knew that you know, I, I had to be really sensitive about contacting people. So I, I've iterated on this email probably like 50 times and really just tried to scrunch it and make it as short as possible. 
So basically, I send an email. This is now automated, but for a long time, I sent each one out manually, just saying hello and offering my contact information. I don't ask a question. I don't send them a huge, long email with tons of images. And I think this email has worked pretty well for me. Again, I, I, it doesn't create more work for the customer, but it starts a conversation if they'd like to. And this has worked well for me. Similarly, this is the one other email I send, which is just a trial reminder. Again, super simple. I've iterated on this uh, more than my welcome email. And I just give them a link to sign up and, again, offer my contact information if they'd like to, to chat. So as Ben mentioned, well, as you guys know now, I, I work on pull reminders alone. And the, the reason this has been really rewarding for me is that when, you know, the whole reason why I wanted to start a business in the first place was to have the most freedom and autonomy in terms of my lifestyle, but also creatively uh, as possible. And you know, this is a quote by Derek Sivers. Raise your hand if you don't know who he is. Okay, just a guy. So he's a guy who sold a company to Apple, I think, in the 90s, and sort of blogger, speaker, has a really great book called uh, Anything You Want. And this is in his bio. So he talks about this idea of working alone as an entrepreneur. It's sort of, it's not, it's not, it's an idea that's kind of discouraged in conventional sort of startup advice. But I can tell you, for me personally, it's been, it's made the process. You know, much more rewarding and compared to two other projects, businesses that I've started with co-founders, I think personally for me it's been more enjoyable. The downside has been, you know, there are difficult things about working alone. The biggest thing for me has been staying positive. So as you can tell, I'm really risk adverse and I get discouraged pretty easily. So when I work alone, I, to be honest, I have a lot of down days. And for me, the solution to this has been that mantra from earlier. You know, if you're an optimist, you'll be rich. I really have to proactively focus on my mental disposition and making sure that I'm staying positive. You know, otherwise, I get down and discouraged, and my productivity just plummets. And finally, you know, one of the hardest things about working alone is, is taking a vacation. So last August, my father uh, had actually planned a backpacking trip for me, my brother, and him, and some of my father's friends. And you know, leading up to this, I was, I was really nervous, because at this point, I, I was just starting to get momentum, and I was having all kinds of tech issues. You know, there had actually been multiple times where my app had crashed like in the middle of a meeting somewhere, and I had to whip out my laptop and you know, get things back online. So, so I worried about being in the wilderness for a week with no internet, and you know, what would happen if my app went down. So I, I thought about you know, how can I, something, this might be a good business idea, I'm not sure. Um, I thought about you know, what can I do? I, I couldn't really come up with anything. I, what I ended up doing is just added my friend, he lives, a friend of mine in Japan. I added him to my Heroku account and said, look, if it goes down, just run Heroku restart over and over again <laughs> until it comes back up. And, and luckily, you know, that didn't happen. Vacation went well, uh, although I did almost get eaten by a bear, which, so, you know, in hindsight, I, I need a uh, transition plan for my business before I go out into the wilderness. So that's my talk. Uh, you know, I hope that you've seen that, you know, building a business, it's, it's really the step-by-step -step process, similar to building software. And, you know, again, the, the main thing that helped me is really focusing on having a good balance between you know, forced blind, blind optimism, but having a rigorous and disciplined, you know, customer validation and go-to-market strategy. So, that's it. Thank you. Great talk, Avi. Thanks. Um, you mentioned that you were doing consulting work originally while you were building out the product. What was the ratio of consulting work to product building, maybe in terms of hours? Yeah, uh, the ratio was based on the work I could get, not like what was the perfect ratio for me. So it, at the very beginning, it was actually almost full time. In fact, I actually took a project out in Dover, New Hampshire at Liberty Mutual, where I was in the office. Uh, but I, I think contract work, you know, when I get a full time job, I, I just get swallowed by it. I, I, even, even if I'm trying to focus on my side project, I just kind of get sucked in. So I think contract work, because of just the relationship between you and the person you know, paying you, for me, it really allowed me to stay focused on my side project, even if the hours I had to put in for the contract work were like full time. But that was just initially. Then the project after that, I went to like half time, 20 hours per week, and then just like kind of ad hoc part time projects after that.
One more question. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, how do you feel about having a simple product and the danger of um, others coming in and take, taking it over? Yeah. Uh, that's one of my biggest sort of, that's one of the main things that gets me negative these days <laughs> is, you know, my, another lesson from this is like, it's really important to have a business that's defensible, right? And for me right now, just the momentum and the word of mouth uh, momentum I have is sort of my, my moat, so to speak. But it's something I'm, I'm actively focused on. One of the things I've done, my business is actually now called Pull Panda, and I've built two other products. So I've been diversifying my offering to, you know, similar to like an investor with a portfolio, lower the risk of any one product, uh, you know, having a competitor or being made irrelevant.